since for a nice introduction. So hello everyone. Uh, so again, it's 9, 9.06 p.m. here in Ontario. It's really dark outside, but uh, it's time to speak about feline reproduction, which is a, a fantastic topic. Um, uh, there is a talk, in, uh, a story behind this talk, in fact. Uh, in, um, when I was in France, uh, I was looking for breeders uh, because all Feline breed. Oh, everybody who wants to become a feline breeder in France needs to go through a three-day course where they will be talked few things on reproduction, infectious diseases, nutrition, genetics, etc. Just be sure that everybody uh, uh, st works uh, stands on solid ground when it comes to living and, and working uh, with cats. Just to be sure that everybody has the basics when it comes to breed cats. And this talk that we're going to do, do tonight is something I did during five years in France, um, which is, I think, extremely interesting because feed, uh, reproduction is a very specific area of uh, small animal reproduction, of veterinary medicine. And uh, there are plenty of things still to learn, but there are already lots of things that you guys can do in your cat trees uh, that you can implement and that can definitely help you in order to optimize the fertility of your individuals. So let's start with things that I hear quite a lot when I speak with people that are not familiar with feline breeding, I would say. Uh, because when I speak to to other persons and I think them, oh, I'm working with feline breeders, some people are sometimes surprised and say, why? You breed cats? Why do you breed cats? Because animals have a good fertility. There's no need to worry. Oh, partition is not a big deal. They will deliver. You don't need to be around when the queen is delivering. Everything will be fine. <laughs> it's easy to obtain large size litters because, again, they have a good fertility and everything is fine in the feline world. So there's no need to be afraid. And they, they don't need somebody like you who specialize in small animal reproduction to breeders. Uh, they will uh, they will confirm me that uh, it's not always that easy. Um, I spent the last ten years, as Justin said, working with canine and feline breeders, and we know that breeding is not easy. Breeding can be difficult. Breeders will face difficult situations. Uh, normal people will never face. Uh, so that's why it's important to for us to do those talks uh, because I truly think that knowing the basics is something mandatory when it comes to canine and feline breeding. And tonight, we will really focus on everything that you guys can do in your career to improve and optimize the fertility and your breeding management. I truly believe that cats will be the animals of the 21st century, uh, and the proportion of purebred cats might be growing, uh, so because there are lots of advantages for sure. It's a really good way to connect with this world and show you uh, how we can help you uh, when you face those difficult situations. So it's the first uh, first part, and we will touch on different things like reproductive physiology, hunting process, and station period. Choose on anatomy because when you start to speak on the uh, on the reproductive function, it's important to touch on uh, the anatomic specificities of those animals. And cats have quite interesting features when it comes to genital anatomy. Uh, in males, first, for sure, when you're breeding cats, uh, it's better to breed cats uh, with two testes in the scrotum. And this is uh, something that sounds funny, but uh, I'm sure breeders uh, know that from time to time you might have a tongue cat, a kitten usually, where one testis or even two testicles are missing. They call ectopic testis or cryptorchidism. And this is usually, um, to, to, to explain you a little bit on that, the test should be in the scrotum at birth, uh, just after birth in kittens. And this is very different from what we will find in dogs, for instance, in puppies. The, the testis will reach a scrotum typically around weaning, around four weeks of age. After usually we cannot feel the testis in the scrotum in the cat, but already here usually. And um, clearly, uh, those testes during the pregnancy, uh, during the gestation and the fetal development are inside the abdomen, next to the kidney, and will migrate through the abdomen and they will go through a structure called the inguinal canal. And when the testis will, uh, and the testis should be in place in the scrotum, usually at least. Uh, 
at six months of age because the inguinal canal will close at six months of age. So we wait until six months of age to confirm that the animal has the two testes in the scrotum. Um, important because, uh, uh, well, if there's one testing, testis missing or even the two of them t missing, there are multiple impl implications. Critical point of view, if the testis is in ectopic position, in, 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 the temperature is increased at the testicular level. And this increase in temperature will increase the risk of testicular tumor. Uh, by 13, uh, a testis in an ectopic position has 13 more chances to transform itself into a tumor. Uh, it's more prone to testicular torsion. So just from a medical point of view, this we will definitely recommend to castrate them because it's definitely uh, the best option, uh, the best medical option we can propose. From a genetic point of view, it's also important to keep in mind that epic testis is the genetic background. So we don't really know what is the genetic determinism. We don't know how it is transmitted from uh, the parents to the offsprings, but their genetic background. Or shouldn't be bred because they, they can be fertile. If one testis is in the scrotum, the testis which is in the scrotum can definitely produce spermatozoa, and this animal will be able to impregnate females when cycling. So, important to, to keep in mind that ectopic testis, cryptorchidism, has genetic background, and from an ethical point of view, those animals shouldn't be bred, and that's why I would recommend to castrate those animals because you don't want to spread those defective genes in the, uh, in the, in, in the feline population. Uh, I touched the fact that um, if it's in the scrotum, the animal is fertile. In fact, the temperature can influence the spermatogenesis, the production of spermatozoa. For instance, if a testis is in an ectopic position, the temperature at the level of this testis, this testicle, will be two, three degrees more than what it will be in the scrotum. And just because of that, this will stop the production of spermatozoa. In the case of weight animals, uh, a lot of fat can infiltrate the scrotum and can locally increase the temperature at the testicular level, which can also lead to infertility issues. So uh, even in cases of uh, very warm weather, that's like what we have today in Toronto, actually, um, you you don't feel it in uh, on the internet, but it's 32 degrees outside here, and uh, these high temperatures can decrease the sperm output, can decrease the sperm production, and can also impact the fertility of these animals. So this is something important to keep in mind. Temperature will definitely influence fertility in cats. Another interesting feature of the cat, uh, a cat, is the it's it's penis. And why is it so important? For sure, when it comes to reproduction, we definitely need a penis. But why is it so important? Because the penis of the cat only finds some, uh, stru some structures called, called penile spines. Those penile spines, in fact, uh, play uh, a very critical role. They will induce ovulation in the female. Remember, and we will touch on that in, in a few slides, but uh, induce ovulators. And uh, the ovulation is induced by the mechanical stimulation of the vaginal wall by those penile spines that we find on the male penis. But more than that, those penile spines are the reflection of the testosterone secretion. So uh, sometimes we wonder if a male is fertile or not. Or, and one of the most interesting things that your veterinarians might look into is the testosterone secretion. Because testosterone is one of the most important hormones, and is the most important hormone to, 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 that we to produce a spermatozoa. If, uh, if, well, if testosterone, an appropriate testosterone secretion, the penile spine will be present on the penis. If this is not the case, it means that the testosterone secretion is not adequate, and that can be a cause of infertility. And you can see here, you might not see it, but there, the, the, the penile spine are just here, but it's very easy to see. If you see that on the penis of the cat, this tells you that this cat secretes as a proper and adequate testosterone secretion. If we can see it, there a problem here, and this is something that can be assessed just by, by visualizing the penis of the cat. Be aware that when we castrate the cat, those penile spines will usually disappear, disappear in approximately one month.
So this is about the fem the male. Let's focus on the female because there are very interesting points to focus on too. First, the vagina of the female. The, the anatomy of the vagina in the queen is very specific because it's very short. We have two sections, and uh, it's very short. It's approximately approximately sorry four centimeter in length. Different from a bitch, for instance, in dogs, uh, the vagina of the bitches will be 50, 30 centimeter length, which makes this predisposed to encounter this vaginal disorder, what we call vaginitis, inflammation of the vagina. In cats, the vagina is very short. There is no secretion like in the bitch during estrus during their season. So the vaginal diseases are really, really, really rare. I am here people speaking about. Fung fungal infection of the vagina, like uh, of the ones that are found in women, uh, but this is extremely uncommon in in mammals, especially in canine, in canine and especially in felines, because uh, the pH and the medium of the vagina of those ma of those uh, small animals is completely different from what we will find in human beings. But uh, this uh, and, and find a fungal infection in cat. I mean, in the vagina. This means that there is a severe, a really severe immunosuppression. The immune system is so weak that I'm not surprised that, unfortunately, this queen is not able to carry a pregnancy. From a practical point of view, vagina being so small, so short, uh, any time we have a vulvar discharge, any time you will observe a discharge at the vulvar level in the queen, there is for a vet consultation. Because in the, this could be related to a vaginitis is an inflammation of the vagina, as I said before. In cats, if you can see a vulvar discharge, this means this means that something might happen at the uterine level. Maybe there is an infection of the uterus, uh, what we call a pyotra uh, in the uterus. And this is why you can see this vulvar discharge. So each time we see vulvar discharge in a queen, there is a need for a vet consultation to check the uterus, to be sure that the vaginitis is not a pyometra, because the prognosis is totally different can be easily cured usually. It's quite easy to control them. Pyometra, the, we just use antibiotics, for instance, which is typically will be used to treat a bacterial infection. Pyometra antibiotics will not be able to cure the pyometra alone. So in the past, the only treatment that was recommended to, to breeders, the only treatment we could do when the queen was experiencing a pyometra was to remove the ovaries and the uterus to perform what we call an ovarioesterectomy. It was the end of the breeding career of the of, of the queen. For today we have medical alternatives that will help us uh, medically treat this uh, condition and in fact um, restore, uh, maintain the fertility potential of these individuals. So this is something that you can discuss with your vet today. And this is these protocols are most of the vets are not really familiar with them, maybe in North America, and uh, because. 80, you, you're living in an environment where 80% of these of the animals, the privately owned animals, are unfortunately are spayed and neutered. So, your veterinarian is not aware of those protocols, and if he wants to learn more on them, he can definitely contact us, and we will be more than happy to share this information with them and to explain them or can use you uh, to face this condition. Because today, in, uh, in the past, pyometra was the end of the reproductive career of the queen. Today it's no more the case. We can efficiently treat these animals and we can maintain the fertility. To, to focus on the bladder, uh, it's important to focus on the bladder in the queen because as you see here, there is, uh, the urinary tract of the queen and the genital tract are kind of connected. Um, and that's why, in fact, urinary disease uh, which is definitely common in all female individuals, it can be in humans, in bitches, and in uh, in queens, will definitely might definitely impact and f affect the fertility. Because if there is a bladder infection, bladder infection uh, will lead to modifications of the pH of the vagina. If the queen is mated at this moment, the spermatozoa will be instantly killed when they reach the, the, the vagina of the queen because of this bladder infection. This comes back to a very simple thing. Each time a queen is, um, each time a queen is suffering from any disease, we need to treat the queen before bringing her. And when you're when you're working with cats, it's definitely something easier uh, when we think about it because cats are cycling 
all well can uh, will cycle several several times during the breeding season as we will see in a few slides uh, if you miss one breeding period you might need to wait maybe three four weeks before being able to breed the cat again which gives you enough time to plan them all and move uh, and then breed her safely if you want the dogs this would not be the case because you might have to wait six months between each season to be able to breed to be able to access uh, to the reproductive to, 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 the, um, to the fertility so that's why in, in a certain way there are some advantages when you breed queens and I was used to to, to, to touch on that with my, with our colleagues uh, with our vet students but, but queens are what we call and cats in general are what we call a seasonal polyhedral species looks like a barbarian term but let's see what it means During breeding season, because there is a breeding season, they will cycle regularly. And, uh, the, cycling, the cycling will stop usually when there will be gestation or what we call pseudo-pregnancy. means that the queen ovulated but was not pregnant, but we will touch on that. Uh, this could be easy, but there are unfortunately several variation factors. That's kind of interesting to know because you can use them in breeding facility to kind of work and properly manage the reproductive activity of your animals. The factor to keep in mind is light. Queens um, and cats in general, uh, the, uh, in queens and cats, the, the breeding season is influenced by the length of the daylight. In the end, there is a small gland called the, the pineal gland, which seeks an hormone called melatonin. The more melatonin is secreted, melatonin is usually secreted during the, during the night, uh, less the um, the more it will negatively uh, stimulate the reproductive function, which means that the longer the night, the less the queens will cycle. And this is why, in fact, in the northern hemisphere, the queens will cycle usually from January, February to September, because this is when daylight is longer, while the, the southern hemisphere, it will be the totally opposite. They will cycle from September to January, February, because this is when the, light, the, the, the day is the, the, the exposure will be longer and if like me you come from an intertropical zone uh, this is fantastic first for the climate and second because in fact um, during in these areas there, there are very few variations uh, in, in daylight all year long, long. I mean, those animals will cycle all year long typically and that's something you can use at your own advantage in your country by working on light protocols to uh, in fact, activate or deactivate the breeding function of your animals. So typically, we know that, that queens need to be exposed to at least 12 to 14 hours of light per day to, to cycle. And if they are exposed to less than 8 hours of light per day, they will stop cycling. We'll see there are other uh, variation factors, but typically this is what we will find. And this is what... Uh, breeders are using in many categories. They use breeding. Uh, they use light protocols like that, so their queens cycle all year long. Or if they want to stop the breeding activity of a queen, they might be able to be and to reduce the exposure to light, so we will stop cycling. If you're interested in learning more about uh, those uh, light protocols, uh, we we published an article on that on our website, so you're more than welcome to go and visit our website and download the article. You will find all uh, the different protocols and all you can use them in your cattery to properly manage the breeding activity of the animals. So a little bit on temperature. Temperature can also impact uh, the fertility and the breeding activity and the seasonality of the queen. Typical cyclicity might stop uh, during one weather. If we're dealing with, uh, with like the one we have today in Toronto, today is the warmest day of summer. It's quite incredible because we're in September. But anyway, um, if we're dealing with very warm weather, this might in fact decrease uh, the ability of the oocyte, of the ovarian follicles to grow on the, ovarian, or on the ovaries of the queen. So cyclicity might be altered, might be stopped because of warm weather. And it can also lead to what we call heat stress. The heat stress is something that is described in plenty of different species, uh, in cows, in dogs, and in queens too. Uh, because of this weather, this might increase the temperature inside the abdomen of the animal. This increase of temperature is something that 
and frankly embryos and uh, oocytes and gametes will not like and this will in fact disrupt the fertility and uh, the, the, the fertility potential of these animals. So one, a practical consequence of that is to try to keep a temperature, a normal temperature inside uh, the breeding category. Typically it should be between 20 and 22 degrees Celsius. Another meter that will affect the seasonality of the queens is the breed, and I'm sure some of you might have experienced that. If breeding Persian queens, for instance, Persian, in the breed, with 90% individuals are seasoned. 90% of the Persian queens will react to the variations in daylight, etc. While if you breed Siamese, only 50% of them will respond to such variations. 50% of Siamese are seasoned, which has one team is out of two. You play with the light protocol as much as you want. This will no effect. They will, uh, they will keep cycling. And we'll see that I mean, these queens are typically considered as the perfect uh, example of what we call in veterinary medicine infomaniac cats because some of them will start cycling and will never stop. And that's why when I was in France, I had something every year, I had approximately 20 calls per year of Siamese breeders telling me that. We needed to do something to stop those uh, queens from cycling, to prevent them from cycling because they couldn't sleep anymore. And that's the reality uh, in Siamese and Oriental breeds, I would say. And that, that you can work on and can really uh, be interesting to work on in a breeding facility, in a category, is the social interaction. The first you can think of is what we call the group effect. We, you know that, uh, and maybe you experienced it sometimes, a group of queens, and will have, you will, um, one of them will start to cycle, all the other one will follow. This is a kind of synchronization that happens because of the secretion of pheromones that we cannot perceive, but that might induce a cycling activity in the queens, and this is very, very common in catries. One starts to cycle, and the other one will follow. That's another funny uh, zootechnical uh, effect we can work on in, in feline breeding. It's what we call the male effect. Typically, if you have a group of females, you put inside this group a male, and the female never in contact with this male before, the presence of the male might activate in some, in, 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 in some way the activity of the females. Just by entering the male in the group, they would start cycling. This is something doing... Uh, in the ship industry, because in ship it's really it's it's a phenomenon that is really well described, and uh, they bring the ram at a very specific time of the year so that uh, the uh, entire flock will start cycling. In cat, we use the same effect, and uh, it can give you very good results. Uh, but for to do it, you need to separate the male from the females and just bring the male during the reproductive season. So these things we can do, but something else that is interesting to, to keep in mind is uh, that stress can play a big role when it comes to induction, uh, to um, expression of the cycle in the queen. For instance, look at this queen here. She looks really stressed. And in some, you know, in a, in a Bengal catchery a few years ago, uh, there was one female that was not cycling because she was really, really stressed out and all the other ones were fighting with her, etc. Uh, she was really, she was dominated by the other female. And because of that, she was stressed. When she's stressed, she secretes cortisol, and cortisol inhibits the reproductive function. So why, what we did is that we removed this queen from the tree. We put in a different environment where she was alone and where she was not stressed. She was before. She had to cycle when we removed her from this stressful environment. So you know your cats better than anybody. If you think that one queen is really, really stressed because of any environmental factor, interesting to remove this and try to put her in better, in less stressful condition so that this might help her to cycle properly and this might definitely have a positive effect on the reproductive function. So what else? This is something I like to ask to, to the audience when I'm doing this talk. Uh, typically people are looking at me like, what is he telling us? Uh, there's no seasonality in the male. Uh, and I, I must admit, I totally agree with you on that because when it comes to breeding, the limiting factor is the female. Females have, uh, well, when they have it, they have 
uh, a breeding season. And this is when you will be able to breed them. So that's why they are the limiting factor when it comes to the cattery. When it comes to male, uh, they're fertile, fertile all year long. When I was at the vet school in Paris, we 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 doing a lot of spermogram, uh, semen analysis of the male cats, and this is something we started to do I think four or five years ago. Uh, and when we started, we uh, when I when I left the vet school, we we were doing many breeders were coming every year to check the fertility of those males, but, but we were collecting males during the year. Any time of the year, I could find some spermatozoans. Semen. There was no moment, like in sheep, for instance, where there is absolutely no spermatozoa in the ejaculate. In male cats, we will find spermatozoa all year long. What he described is that there are a stronger libido weather during the breeding season. We kind of normal, I would say, because there are more female in estrus around them. And interesting to see that there are publications, scientific publications, concerning the seasonality of male. These patients were done by a group, um, one of my colleagues in Norway or Sweden, I don't remember, but in somewhere in Northern Europe. And um, in fact, they thought that during the non breeding season of the females, they could have spermatozoa in the ejaculate of the males, but had a lower motility and had a lower number of spermatozoa and more abnormal forms. It can indeed be related to a certain kind of seasonality in males. This also be related, in the opinion of many of my colleagues, to the fact that outside breeding season, those animals, uh, they are less used for for breeding purpose. So, all germ will accumulate in the epididymis, the structure next to the testes that stores spermatozoa before ejaculation. And, uh, this accumulation, uh, the longer the sperm will stay in this epididymis, the quality will be decreased. So that might explain why outside the breeding season, because the males are used less for reproduction, they have a, a, a low quality semen, a lower quality semen than will be fine during the breeding season. But it's interesting to see that um, the males are fertile all year. The limiting factor will definitely be the female in the breeding unit. When it's to puberty in females, uh, typically we tend to say that, well, we tend to say, Rizzo has that they occur between 4 to 15 months of age. This is a very l uh, large range because uh, when we think about it, there are several factors that can affect that. One of them is the body weight. Um, we need to reach approximately 75% of, that, of adult weight to be able to cycle. Uh, typically, it represents 2 to 2.5 kilograms for what we would call a normal female. Uh, it must be a little bit more for a main coon, I guess. But... And this is something interesting to, to notice uh, because we tend to think that, the, in fact, there is a relation with the body weight and the sexual activity. Very simple reason. The body weight, uh, the fat tissue of the animals only store energy but to increase sex hormones. It, it, it secretes estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, one hormone we call leptin. And those hormones, in fact, when uh, the body is appropriate, it will send a signal to the individual saying, okay, uh, to, to, to the brain saying, okay, this individual will uh, reach its maximal weight and can um, enter the reproductive, uh, can, can start the repro uh, reproductive uh, life, I would say. So, you to keep in mind of this condition because body weight can influence the the, um, the fertility and the reproductive function of the queens and the male cats, and we will touch, we'll come back to this in a few slides. Based on the other factors that can influence the puberty males, the, the onset of puberty, the date of birth, the breed, social contacts, and the lifestyle. Concerning uh, the the date of birth, let's uh, take this example. A queen is born, a, a kitten is born in August. She will have her first season in February, which is approximately six months of age, and which is usually what we would say to our clients, it might start cycling around six months. But Evelyn was born in March. Logic say that, okay, she should start cycling in October, approximately. But think about it, and in, in, in the real life, it's very, very common, we, uh, very often we will observe the first estrus in February in this queen. 
it comes back to what I said a few slides before, the, day, the length of the daylight. You see, queens will start to cycle on the first spring after their birth. So that's why, depending on when they are born, during the year, they might cycle earlier or later. It's abnormal. It's just because of the influence of the daylight on these animals. And uh, the breed will play a big role. So usually, and you would see that in uh, uh, during all this presentation, in feline reproduction, we tend to oppose per queens, uh, Persian, Persians, and all Persian-related breeds to Oriental and Siamese-related breeds, I would say. They are really the two biggest extremes we can find when it comes to feline reproduction. Persian queens usually start to start cycling around one year, as you can see the, on this graph. Oriental and Siamese-like animals will start cycling around 7.5 months. So there is a very big gap here, which again is extremely interesting for the reprovets like me. Let me, me clarify that. For instance, if dealing with infertility in queen, if queen is an oriental queen, and for instance, you never saw this queen cycling, we uh, start to worry for this animal. We we'll ask you for a consultation. We, we can wait that the queen is here typically. And then if nothing occurs at one year of age for a Siamese queen, this is we'll start doing some investigations. Persian queens, they will become mature. Uh, they will take more time to, to become sexually mature. So if at 12 age, you still don't observe anything, we will not worry. We will ask you to wait six months more to investigate again, uh, unless you really want us to investigate. But in, you see that depending on the breed, in some cases, we will start doing investigating the case earlier. While dealing, when dealing with Persian and Persian related breeds, we will wait one year half and sometimes up to two years of age be starting to investigate because again those animals those specific breeds uh, become sexually mature later in life compared to Siamese and Oriental. So let's speak a little bit about males because males are important too when it comes to puberty in males there are two things to focus on. Uh, puberty is first uh, there's a behavioral part in puberty which is related to the mating ability, the ability of the male to properly mate a female. Be aware that um, in certain, again, Persian and Persian like cats will not be able to properly mate the female at two years of age. Uh, we also have to consider something else, like uh, the spermatogenesis, uh, when it's puberty, the, the secretion of spermatozoa inside the gene in, inside the uh, the teeth. Usually, the first spermatozoa will find in the ejaculate of these animals around six, six, eight months of age. But however, they are not able to properly mate yet. So, and it's uncommon that those first ejaculates uh, will contain very, uh, very few. Um, let's say be of very low quality. Will have lots of abnormal forms, very low motility, not a high number of spermatozoa. So it's important to keep in mind that again, uh, some it's observed spermatozoa uh, that ejaculates will be of very bad quality. So sometimes we need to wait a little bit more, uh, one, year, one year and a half, even years of age in Persian cats, to see them reach their full potential in terms of fertility. And again. In male too, we will have this big opposition. We will oppose the Persian and Oriental cats, which tend to become sexually mature earlier. Six months of age is not common in Siamese, while Russian cats, it's not common to see them fully mature at two years of age. And in terms of investigation, same thing like in the female, we will not start doing the investigation before two years of age in Persian, while we will start earlier in Siamese. Something that will give you lots of information is uh, also focusing on the estrus behavior of the queen. So usually people tell me, oh, it's very easy to know that, that the queen is estrus. We just need to listen to her. And that's true. Uh, usually when the queen is estrus, you will start, you will hear her vocalizing. You will see her uh, 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 getting close to the walls, uh, uh, showing very specific signs. 
But in some cases, this bear is totally absent. Like Persians again, so I have nothing against Persian, but this is really the case, the, a very, very something very specific to the breed. When I was working in, again in Paris. Most of the cases I was seeing were related to the Persian breed because of these specificities, and that's important to have them in mind. I had a client uh, who couldn't observe any signs of estrus of any kind of of uh, season in her queen because in, fa in fact the queen was, was very uh, the signs were very subtle so we had to see the queen uh, routinely to do vaginal swabs to try to detect uh, the onset of the bleeding period because from an external point of view there was nothing that could be seen and on the other hand sometimes it can be really disturbing like I touched on the example of the Siamese but some Siamese uh, it was really, really common for me to have a bill calling me and say, oh, this Miss Queen is in perpetual heat. Please do something because I cannot sleep anymore. Uh, we need to stop that. Um, she, she's a very valuable breeding cat, but if she continues like that, I will just pay her so I will be quiet. And fortunately today, well, there are some alternatives that can be proposed to uh, to face this situation. Position in cats is something really specific. And I'm pretty sure you know that there are induced ovulators, and this is something that can be found in other species of mammals, like, like camels, rats, ferrets, and this is something that might make our life easier when it comes to feline breeding, because maybe you are aware, in dogs, we typically uh, we can, in fact, uh, have to do a timing of ovulation to detect the ovulation. In cats, ovulation is induced by mating. So typically, the queen in season, you put the queen with the male, the male will mate the female, which will induce in ovulation. Easier to determine the day of ovulation because it will be induced by mating, so you don't need to detect, you don't need typically all ways to detect ovulation. One thing that you or whoever have to keep in mind, we know today that uh, when I was at the vet school, I was working on ultrasound, on ultrasound, of ultrasound in the queens. And uh, we did a very interesting study showing that, in fact, the, fo the, the ovarian follicles, the structures on the ovaries that contain the oocyte, will reach their, full, their, their biggest size three days after the onset of estrus. Is it important? It means that if the starts a season, you need to wait, uh, if you wait three days after the beginning of the season to put her with the male, the follicles at this time will be bigger, which means uh, you're quite higher quality uh, in terms of oocyte and potentially better fertility results. So these, these data were obtained only in Abyssinian cats, and but we're pretty sure that this might be quite similar in many breeds. So instead of, I know that many breeders will put the male and the female together as soon as the, the, the season starts in the female, but it can be interesting to wait three days before bringing, putting the female with the male. So the, ferti the, the, the oocytes and the the all sites will be better, and this might positively influence the reproductive efficiency. Something important to keep in mind: 50% of queens will ovulate after a single mating. What does this mean? If there's only one mating, one queen out of two will not ovulate. There is a need of several matings, at least three of them, to do uh, that ovulation occurred thanks to mating. If there's only one mating that occurred. This can be uh, this can be uh, this can ovulate might not occur and that can be a cause of infertility. I will have a specific slide on that, but just to to remind it to you already, the first cause of infertility in queens is no matings or lack of matings, uh, because uh, we need to be sure that the queen was mated at least three times, so it induce it properly induce ovulation. If this was the case. Unfortunately, that can be the cause of of infertility. To make worse, spontaneous ovulation may occur in the queen. Uh, we think today that approximately 30% of the queens might spontaneously ovulate. No for uh, for mating, no for creatures, they ovulate without any other uh, any other thing. And this is something uh, I noticed in some of the queens had, uh, in our cat in Alpha. They were not in contact with any male. They were ov some of them were ovulating for, and it's certainly related to spontaneous ovulation. Uh, it's if they are spontaneous ovulators, this might complicate 
breeding protocol. And this is when you need to, to work with your vet to find out what the, what's the best alternative to deal with this queen. Uh, induced ovulators, ovulation can be induced by coitus, ovulation can also be induced by the use of a cotton tip. And this is something many, many breeders, especially Siamese breeders, are using for, again, a simple reason. You will simulate ovulation in these queens. So uh, remember the Siamese, sometimes they are, it seems that they are always in estrus. It can be a real, I think in English you say, pain in the ass to have those queens around you cycling and meowing per permanently that you will induce ovulation. So you will prolong the interval between the, um, the reproduc the, between the seasons. So we, you will uh, have a kind of test of uh, yourself. Be aware that when you're doing that, a web will induce ovulation, which means you will induce secretion of another hormone called testosterone. Progesterone uh, can actually influence the development of some uterine diseases like kistic endometrial hyperplasia and pyometra. Uh, that we we touch a little bit on them at the beginning of this talk, but, but I think that this is one of the most relaxing to 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 approach the interestrous interval in the queens, so that it's easy to manage in the catri, especially if you have queen cycling permanently. It's important to keep in mind that there might be some downsides. In case, well, it's still I prefer you to do that than using compounds like drugs like. Uh, progestins, which are progesterone der derivatives that we are using a lot, a lot, a lot in Europe because this will stop uh, the breeding season. And this is something usually feline breeders like before the shows because when they are in season, uh, there will be some impact on the quality of the coat, etc. And now the queens will have less chances to win at the show. But if this, uh, well, if you, uh, the progestins that we use in, Euro in Europe, we really try to tell the breeders that they shouldn't use it because these drugs have, uh, they, they, have uh, they are 150 to 200 times more potent than the normal progesterone, which significantly increases the risk of development of uterine diseases and mammary gland diseases as well. So this would be the best alternative at the moment in North America. If, uh, but you just need to keep in mind that if there is, if you observe any abnormal discharge, etc., it's important to, to go and check with your vet, because that might be the downside of it. To explain you what happens during the coitus, uh, when the male mates the female, remember the penile spines, they will induce the secretion of an hormone in the brain, which is the LH, and in fact, with waiting, we will have a small peak of LH like this. But to go above this orange line, which represents the threshold we need to reach to induce ovulation. So that's why we need several matings, because you see, when there are several matings, more LH will be secreted, and if more LH is secreted, this will definitely help uh, give more chances for ovulation to be induced. And when we reach this threshold after several matings, 12 to 30 hours after, the queen will, uh, will ovulate. So again, this is why we need several matings in the queen to properly induce ovulation because we need to go above this threshold. And if this does not happen, this can prevent ovulation from happening. As I said, typically time between LH peak and ovulation is approximately 24 hours. And from that, this is the typical protocol we will command in terms of breeding in cat trees. Today, you will put the male and the female together so that they start um, meeting each, uh, each other. So they start dating, I don't know if we can start in, in cat but uh, if they, they will meet each other and they will get to each other. On the, day, uh, on the second day, typically, they will start mating. Then, when mating will start, um, if there are several mating during the same day, uh, they induce the LH peak. Well, don't worry too much because usually, um, well, I used to, to, to video <laughs> videotape uh, the breeding activity of our, of our cats at the cat arena so just to be able to show it to our students, so there are a little bit of information on that. But, but we are usually uh, the males, when they are uh, good breeding males, they might mate the females, I don't know, 10 times in 30 minutes sometimes. So and this definitely, uh, if uh, if the male is a good breeding male, this shouldn't be a problem, and the H peak might be induced very easily. But it's important for you guys to check. You must be able to, t to say 
okay, okay, I observed the mating attempts. I know that the mating was successful because of what I'm going to tell you in a few slides, because you observed some specific signs. But you need to be able to tell that. If you can say that, uh, reprovets like me can do can perform of dollars of complementary examinations to try to find out what's going wrong in your queen. Why, if this is a problem, we will answer right now. Uh, we will have the answer, and we will know what to do to help you improve the fertility of your animal. So this is really important for you guys to, to be able to, to notice, to detect, and tell your vet that it properly happens. Typically, well, this is a three-day uh, mating uh, schedule. On the third day, typically, the queen will be mated, ovulation will occur, and fecundation will occur, typically. There are types of cycles that can be observed in the queen. Typically, the queen is mated, and two can happen. The queen can ovulate, or it might not ovulate, which leads to what we call an anovulatory cycle. So, in an anovulatory cycle, you can see that during the breeding season, you have several estrogen that are separated by an interval which can vary from, as you can see here, three weeks to one year. So three, three weeks is what we observe in average. Most of the queens will cycle every three weeks. But a year, one year, some queens, again, might cycle only once a year. It's even worse than what we can observe in most of the beaches. So that's why it's important to sometimes to, to be able to clearly detect when is the onset of the breeding season, because in some Persian queens and some Persian-related uh, they access only once uh, to the reproductive to, to, to reproduction per year. On the other hand, look at here, Chinese and Oriental queens. Sometimes the interest interval will only be one day, which uh, it looks like that this is what in veterinary medicine we call the Nisomania queen. So clearly you have several uh, estrus periods overlapping, and uh, it looks like the queen is in permanent estrus, which has some downsides too, because there's permanent estrogen impregnation of the uterus, which can in fact favor uh, the risk of development of uterine disorders, more pyometria, cystic endometrial hypoplasia, which are small cysts in the uterine layer, which can disturb fertility. Can, in the, can develop when uh, we have this successive uh, overlapped impre estrogenic impregnation. Some can be due to the owners, so this is something hard for us to put in the conversation. But in fact, uh, some uh, women are using uh, postmenopausal creams, which are uh, made, which contains estrogens, and those creams are put typically on the hands, on the forearms, etc., uh, because they will penetrate through the skin. And if you hold the cats and the queens, uh, the queen might also go through the skin of the other animals and then, unfortunately, induce estrus activity in those animals and maintain the estrus activity. But sometimes we have spay queens that were coming in consultation uh, because they were showing estrus activity because they, the, the spay was not properly done, but because of the owners uh, giving them some estrogen uh, because of the medication they were taking. So this is anecdotal, but every year I had five cases like that in, in, in France. So I think it's important to keep in mind that, that some medications, especially hormonal medications you might take, might um, influence uh, the, the reproductive function of your queens, especially because you, can, you will hold them in your hands. And if this goes through the skin, the, the queens might receive those hormones too. So an cycle will typically occur when there is nothing, for sure this can be a cause, and this is uh, not uncommon in, in some breeds because you will put the male and the females together and the male just be, will show no interest in the female. Or when mate failure will occur, uh, some breeders reporting me that, for example, uh, the female, when she saw the male, she just rolled back on her, on her, just rolled her back and, and Mating cannot occur because the male cannot bite the female, and as we will see in few slides. So, interest period will definitely depend on different things like breed, social interaction, stress. Again, we touch on these factors, but these factors can also influence uh, the reproductive interest period. Second, can happen the queen is ovulating, so it leads to an ovulatory cycle, and uh, then two things can occur fecundation or not. Let's focus on when the queen relates, but there is no fecundation. 
This is what we call a pseudo-pregnancy. So when there is a pseudo-pregnancy, remember the queen ovulated? So the creation of, a, of gesturon, which is secreted by the corpora lutea, which are very specific structures that are, appear on, on the ovaries after ovulation. And progesterone will be secreted in case of pregnancy, when the queen is not pregnant, approximately 40 days. We know that from a zootechnical point of view, you will increase in the interestrous interval. So again, we will see that the queen ovulated, and uh, the interestrous interval will be maybe three weeks plus 40 days. So we see that after the queen and she is not pregnant, we can definitely suspect that um, a pregnancy occurred. If we want to confirm that, we can do a progesterone sample in the beach, assess uh, assay heat, that will see if ovulation occurred or not. So the will typically occur when you breed the female with a sterile or subfertile male. Again, keep in mind today we have ways to check the fertility of the male. When malformation in the geni genital tract of the queen, one of the most common malformations I was uh, I was dealing with sometimes is use some kind of membranes just in the middle of the uterine horns, which that the testis, the, uh, the spermatozoa can reach the uterine tubes where fertilization will occur in the queen. So just because of these membranes, uh, the heating of the gametes of the gametes cannot occur. And if this cannot occur, indeed, uh, obviously the queens will be infertile. But she ovulated. Or if you ov if you induce ovulation using a cotton tip, this will also lead to a pseudo pregnancy. Last scenario: the queen is she's pregnant. Pregnant. She is pregnant. Typically, you will have secretion of progesterone during up to 65 days, which is a longer period, and at the end of that, the queen will definitely give birth to the kittens if everything goes well. So let's find the mating process and the different things that you can learn from it from a zootechnical point of view. Before starting the breeding career, there are a few things that you should focus on to do. The breeding career of the female. Typically, we recommend to start from, we recommend to breed them from one year to six, seven years of, el, uh, of age. Uh, when I say one year, this might sound young, but I think the most important thing to start the breeding career of an animal is to be sure that the animal reach uh, uh, up optimal, uh, uh, optimal breeding size, a uh, proper adult conformation that allows proper breeding. And this is something important because some breeds might reach this conformation later in life. Again, that's something we can find in large breed cats like Maine Coons. But most of them, around one year, one year and a half, they will be very close to their proper, uh, let's say, reproductive conformation. Usually we don't recommend them to breed after six, seven years of age for a simple reason. After six, seven years of age, uh, there is, uh, the uterine muscle, what we call the myometrium, will become weaker. So the uterine contractions will be weaker and there will be an increase in the rate of difficulty to give birth. So that's why usually we don't recommend to breed after six, seven years old. And I'm sure all of you have plenty of examples of queen that were bred, properly bred after seven years of age, but in age, this is not something we would recommend. Uh, mind that when it comes to bred males, especially Persians sometimes, they will be totally unable to mate before two years of age. So again, in person we will not be with before two years of age, and we will not start doing investigation before two years of age. Finally, before bring check the anatomy, check the external anatomy. Now check the vulva, be sure that there is no vaginal discharge. If you have any vulvar discharge in the queen, keep in mind it's totally abnormal. This must motivate a veterinary consultation because this can be the reflection of uterine disease uh, to the pyometra, and you need to do something because this can be life threatening if we let this evolve. In the in the in the male, look at uh, the, the area around the surrounding the penis. In some uh, large uh, long hair coats, uh, long hair breeds like uh, Persians, um, we find some air plugs around the penis, and that fact. Uh, might be problematic because of these air plugs. Uh, when this male will, when this male will to breed the female, this might lead to a painful erection. And if he thinks that if, if uh, during the first breeding attempts uh, he found that, that erection painful, maybe this male will stop one, will not be willing to breed anymore. 
So I usually recommend in those breeds to clip the area around um, around the penis before breeding. Same thing in the female, just to be sure that uh, it will not interfere with the breeding ability. Vaccination status must be up to date, especially in queens. We don't recommend to vaccinate pregnant queens because, in fact, uh, compounds we're using in the vaccines, um, typically the ones that are used to stimulate the immunity against uh, um, penlocopenia, uh, might uh, go through the placenta and might induce a defect called uh, um, ataxia, uh, a neurological disorder in kittens. Be properly vaccinated before breeding. And I think it's important before breeding to do some blood tests to well to, check, to screen the animals for specific diseases that you don't want to uh, bring inside your cattery. For instance, for the most important thing, we'll definitely to check the, their status regarding feline leukemia and and FIV, feline immunodeficiency virus. Especially in leukemia, keep in mind that feline leukemia and FIV have Severe, can severely impact the reproductive function. If, defects, if these uh, diseases enter the cattery, this might be a disaster because it might take up to one year more than that, and something the completely um, it might completely stop your breeding proto your breeding program because of just to get rid of those diseases. I definitely encourage most of the breeders are doing this already doing this, but this is something I will really encourage you to use because those tests are essential to protect uh, the sanitary health of your cattery. Coronavirus, you know that we speak a lot about the feline coronavirus because the mutation of this virus will to, can lead to a disease called FIP. However, if you test cats for coronavirus, approximately 80% of them might will be will turn out to be positive. So it's not abnormal. Uh, again, if uh, I was discussing with a veterinarian in Montreal a few months ago, and she she worked on FIP, and she's telling me that, that she said that the test kills more cats than the disease, the FIP disease. The cat is positive to the test. The test only look for coronavirus. It not be FIP. Uh, it can be, but it just means that the cat is positive to coronavirus, and 80% of cats are positive to coronavirus. Uh, the mutation of this virus will leave a clinical disease called FIP, but cannot make the difference between the coronavirus and the, and the FIP virus. So we, FIP is a very, very interesting topic, and we won't have time tonight to, to turn this one. But in my opinion, it's not really interesting to test for coronavirus. Uh, this was suggested in the past, but there are so many positive cats today that uh, I think there's no point testing. Uh, it's about testing those cats for coronavirus before breeding. Something very interesting, uh, and I think that you guys should do, especially if you're breeding at-risk breeds, uh, but we'll speak more about this next week, is blood testing those individuals. We know in kittens there is a disease called neonatal, neonatal, neonatal isoerythrolysis that, res that in fact is a result of a blood incompatibility between the male and the female, and that might affect the kittens at birth. It's something that we can check before feeding by blood typing those individuals. And these tests are now available in veterinary medicine. And usually breeders know that if their breed is predisposed to the disease or not. We will Again, we will touch on this next week. But this is something I would definitely encourage you to do if you're working with a, a breed uh, known, known to be at risk for this disease. And very important, before breeding, focus on pre-breeding body condition. I'm sure you're familiar with this scale. Uh, it's seen a lot in the veterinary practices nowadays for a very specific reason. You, I'm sure you're aware that the main, this, we're, what, the main threat we're facing at the moment in veterinary medicine is overweight in our pets. 5% of dogs and 52% of, dog, of cats uh, are uh, overweight today. Again, because of that, condition of fat tube can interfere with the reproductive function when it comes to breeding cats. I must admit that when I when I was working with breeding cats, usually you guys have uh, your animals have a very good body condition because if it was the case, well, they would not win at the, the cat show. So um, this is something you pay attention to. But 
I'm going to emphasize this too much again because we know that an excess fat will lead to, uh, will lead to uh, almost secretion that can disrupt the mechanisms of the reproductive function. It, can in, it might, in some cases, uh, increase the risk of ovarian cysts and infertility. So, proper nutrition during the pre-breeding period is essential because before breeding, you need this queen to be in optimal body condition. This is the best thing, the most important thing uh, to be sure that the, the, um, uh, the, the, the body will not interfere in any way it's with the reproductive function. And stress when you're breeding your cats because cats are very, very sensitive to stress. Males are really territorial. That's usually you guys will have to bring your queen at the place for being because if you bring a male Outside his, uh, his home, he will not feel, uh, he will not smell the sense he's used to smell, and might be stressed, and he might decide, okay, I will not smell this female. He decides to do so. Very few things we can do today, and that's why we need to be sure that the males are not stressed at all when uh, they are going to breed the female. Any stress might prevent them from breeding the females. But the females, even more common, a typical case. Um, Bree will uh, tell me that, okay, they were going to, they took the female, the female was in season. They put the female in a crate and they drove to the, to, to the male's place to, so the female could be mated. But when I was at the male's place, it's not showing any more, uh, showing signs of uh, estrus anymore. Because the transport leads to stress, and the stress of transport stops the estrus behavior, inhibit the ovarian function. So very typical, and that's why usually what we would recommend today is to bring the female to male's place before beginning of her season. So she starts her season at the male's place, so she will be bred at the male's place, and then you will bring her back to your to you to to your home, uh, so that there will be no inhibition of the estrus behavior because of stress. So it might not always be feasible, but that would be the best alternative we can come up with today to face the stress issues very, very common in cats. So step by step, and that's very important. It looks like fun, I would say, but uh, uh, the essential information we will learn from, from this. Uh, first, uh, there will be what we call the male's approach, and the male will buy the female, it's a bite, so it will immobilize the female and will be able to maintain the female while breeding her. This is why, uh, it's, uh, the next bite can be inhibited in males, especially if they suffer from dental diseases. And that's why it's important before breeding the males to check um, uh, their, uh, the, uh, the, uh, their dental health because this, if they cannot properly bite the female, uh, they might not be able to immobilize the female. And if they cannot immobilize the female, again, uh, this is when infertility cases can occur. So it can be 30 seconds to 4 hours. It really depends on the male and the female's experience. One important thing from that, uh, uh, oh, I, I will touch on it on the next slide, but uh, the coitus is very short, 10 seconds, very quick in cats, and when this will occur, the female will start pedaling with its rear legs, and you will then observe what we call the post reaction, which is an essential thing you guys should observe, because uh, if you observe this cohort of behavioral signs, you can tell for sure that, okay, mating occurred and it, it, it was proper mating. Uh, there was penetration, ejaculation, everything went fine because I saw this post reaction, which consists in, in fact, a specific mowing, oh, sorry, it's impossible to pronounce in French, but this specific mowing uh, is a very, very typical from being. When there was penetration, you will hear that. And moreover, you will see an aggressive reaction towards the male. So typically the female will turn back and just slap the male in, in the face. And aggressive reaction is also a way to confirm that ma proper mating occurred. Uh, practical, point of, practical point here, uh, usually we don't recommend to put together, uh, to, uh, to use a, a young male with a very, very aggressive female for a very simple reason. Female is very aggressive and um, the male is a young male. He starts mating the female, but then he is uh, silly beaten by the female, and he, he is completely traumatized by this experience. He associates 
with pain and he will never breed again. So, you, and same thing if we use an aggressive male with a young female. So, when it comes to the first experience, the first sexual experience of your cats, it's important to put them with easy partners, an easy male or an easy female, so that they will, they will feel more confident then, and uh, they will not associate bring with pain, and, uh, and that's something important because this can really condition the future of the, their breeding career. The thing you'll observe, disorientated ring and frictioning, frantic leaking, genital leaking, those signs must be observed to confirm that, that the, to, to confirm that uh, promating occurred. And these are things you guys can see. You guys uh, can tell to your veterinarian, okay, I saw those signs, I know that promating occurred. And this will give us lots of information on how to better approach your specific case. There will typically be a refractory period where the female refuses to be mounted by the male. Typically, the length is more or less variable. It can be some minutes, it can be hours, it can be for life. It really depends on uh, the compatibility between the individuals and their level of aggressivity, I would say. But again, this is something important. You need to be able to check that the proper amount of mating occurred. Remember, at least three mating should occur to induce ovulation. And that's why you need to, to be able to confirm to confirm this. Some of our males, uh, some of our, uh, our cats are shy, and maybe if you're around, they won't, uh, they won't do anything. But today we have ways to check it. You use uh, a, a webcam w that will uh, help you visualize what's going on in, uh, in, the, breeding lo in the breeding room. And um, you can watch it on your TV while sipping a, a cup of coffee. Sounds fun, but this is a very, very zootechnical data. Again, for veterinarians like me, we need to to deal with infertility because keep in mind the first cause of infertility in the fish species is no things or not enough mating. And tell us that this probably occurred. This is a big plus for us because this will definitely help us in the investigation. If we don't know, uh, we can launch thousands of dollars of uh, complementary examination to find out what's going wrong, but maybe it's just because the queen was not properly mated. So now let's touch on pregnancy, which is also something very interesting. Pregnancy in the queen is typically 63 to 65 days from the day of ovulation. And the practical point of view, uh, I mean, because we have, uh, we, it's an uh, in, it's an, uh, ovulation is induced in the species, species uh, usually we will count 65 days from the second day of mating, uh, because this is typically when ovulation will occur. Uh, again, uh, typically we would say that you shouldn't worry 60 days after the last mating occurred. But, but to truth, and we will touch on this next week, uh, I think it really depends on your breeding experience, on your experience in female breeding. So we we'll always recommend to breeders, and this is something I'm telling to students, to if you if you feel like there's something going wrong, if you have any doubt, go and visit your vet. Go for an emergency consultation. We have the tools today to check if everything is fine. We can do an ultrasound to check the vitality of, of the kittens. Um, we have the tools to tell you that okay, we can wait, or no, we can't wait. Maybe we should go for an emergency C-section. Maybe at the beginning you will visit your vet for nothing, and they will tell you, okay, everything is fine. But uh, it's better to wait and lose an entire litter. So the more uh, parturitions you will go through in your, in, with your cat, the more expert you will become. And, and for there are no rules. Uh, when we are dealing with parturition in queens or cats, you know, or any mammals, we have to be stressed. I mean, um, for some cats, uh, difficulty to birth is really, really less common than, for instance, in dogs. But still, uh, it's, uh, with several kittens, you have no way to predict exactly how it will go. So if you have any doubt, do it. go with your vet, and, he, and this is how you will learn. Then you learn when, uh, with your experience, you will learn that, okay, with this queen, it's okay, I can wait. Or this queen, something went wrong, I shouldn't wait. So really don't hesitate. And, and do an emergency consultation if any doubt. 
something extremely important concerns the feeding management during pregnancy. Why is it important? Uh, let me tell you a story. When I was at the vet school in France, I have to admit, this is something I was never touching on with my clients. Uh, for a reason, I was assuming everybody knew how to properly do it. And I arrived in Canada uh, at the beginning of, uh, of me being here. I said, okay, let's can let's ask some questions concerning feeding management during pregnancy. And I realized that, in fact, I, had, uh, I was going in the cat shows with my iPad and I had some tests, uh, some quizzes that you could take. And uh, one of the questions was, oh, you sh should you manage, uh, oh, you manage uh, nutrition during pregnancy in the quiz? And most of the answers were wrong. So it was very, very interesting to see, that, in fact, many people thought that we should feed in the same way we should feed a bitch during pregnancy because those two species are very different when it comes to this. So yeah, this is uh, the body weight uh, uh, curve of uh, a bitch during pregnancy. It increases when you get the curve in this. You see that it changes from part of the gestation to 32 days of the gestation approximately there will be no increase in body weight. In fact, in bitches, bitches take 70% of their body weight during pregnancy during the, last, uh, during the last 20 days of pregnancy. It's totally different. The brain, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the weight is constant because something extremely different uh, in, in, in bitches, bitches will be able to Nutrition during lactation in bitches will provide them enough energy to sustain this lactation because the main issue is in fact during lactation. Just what they're fed, the bitches will be able able to cope with their nutritional requirements during lactation. In queens, not the case. What happens? Queens always lose a little bit of weight during lactation because they need to uh, they need to export an increase an increasingly increasingly oh sorry it's hard to say in English uh, amount of energy to to maintain a proper lactation so that way they will store energy during pregnancy and that's why in bitches we will increase the energetic content of the diet during the last 20 days of pregnancy in queens we will be doing this since the beginning of pregnancy just to ensure that they will receive enough energy, uh, they will be able to store this energy to fulfill their uh, nutritional requirements during lactation. So that's why in queens we will start increasing the energetic content of the diet by plus 10% every week, starting at the beginning of pregnancy, which is totally different from what we will find in the beach. Uh, again, if you are interested in that, there we, we posted a video on our website that I really encourage you to, to have a look on uh, that explains how to properly manage, uh, how properly manage the, um, nutrition during pregnancy in the queens and that will uh, give you all the details you need to know to, to optimize the nutritional management of your during pregnancy. Correct feline pregnancy. Well, Usually people tell me that they will focus on behavior, and for sure, behavior, you know your cats, you will be able to detect some subtle modifications that veterinarians like me will pay attention to. Some will seek for more attention, some queens will become very aggressive and will not want you to be around anymore. Okay, uh, but you come to see me. And you say, I think the queen was pregnant because I saw that uh, this, I, I, I detected this behavioral modification. Uh, I'm pretty sure she was pregnant, but she must have miscarried because nothing in the end is reliable enough because those behavioral modifications might only be related to an hormonal secretion of progesterone typically. So it might be indicative. But this is not enough for veterinarians like us because we will need to investigate more to see if there was indeed uh, an, a pregnancy that started or not. The modification, the weight gain, as I said, it's continuous, but usually it will be very difficult to detect before one month. And keep in mind that, that any pregnancy, that pregnancy arrest that uh, occurs before 35 days of pregnancy will be totally unnoticed because the 
because will be literally digest, digested by the uterus of the of, of the queens. So anything that happens prior to 35 days of pregnancy will not notice. So medical modifications are not a good way to also give a clear idea, uh, tell us for sure if the queen was pregnant or not. This quite reliable, I must admit, uh, and breeders use it a lot, is the color of the tits of the, of the queens. So typically, when the queen is pregnant, especially uh, the, qu the tits will become pinker and bigger. So in primiparous queens that uh, have their first litter, it's something really very obvious, and you will be able to observe this sign around 20, 25 days after the beginning of pregnancy. Queens get older, and when they have several litters, this might be attenuated, and this might become more difficult to detect. So again, I think the sign in um, primiparous queens, but in pluriparous queens, queens that add several liters, this might not be really eff effective in detecting beginning of in detecting pregnancy. People are doing abdominal palpation, which is very very easy to perform in queens. Around 20 25 days, you will be able to feel small vesicles inside the abdomen of the animal. You have experience to do that, and, and again, it's easier in cats and then in dogs, and I really encourage you to try. Uh, to tell you a funny story, when I was a student, I tried to do that uh, the first time I had to diagnose pregnancy in a queen. And I said, oh, I'm pretty sure she's pregnant. I went to do an ultrasound, the queen was pregnant. Uh, what I felt was well, the bladder of the queen, because I was inexperienced, and this was the first time I was performing this uh, um, this this. Uh, again, many feline breeders that are used to perform this and that are very good and were able to tell me that oh, I'm sure this queen is pregnant because I can feel the embryos, the, the vesicles. Uh, again, self, this is the best way to learn. One thing, uh, you will be able to induce abortion during this palpation. Uh, because, well, well, you can induce abortion, but for that, you need to grab the vesicle and really cr try to crush I'm pretty sure your queens will not let you do that, but um, this is the way you can induce abortion. If you're doing a gentle abdominal palpation, you will be able to feel the embryo, the, the embryonic vesicles, and, and it will be totally harmless for, for the queen. The whole technique is definitely ultrasound. So usually when I'm telling that, many breeders will say, you know, ultrasound is very expensive, a test, and this is not something we can afford, etc. And I totally get it. But I think in some difficult cases, like queens that uh, experience infertility issues, etc., this is a very valuable tool because it gives you m m much more information than any other test. It will tell you if the queen is pregnant or not. It will tell you if the kids are alive or not because we will be able to visualize the orbits. So it's a real-time vitality assessment in this litter. It's an estimation of the number of fetuses. Be aware that when we're doing an ultrasound, we cannot give you an exact count, but we will give you an, an estimation of the number of fetuses. The only way to have an exact count will be to use the X-rays. Uh, but again, uh, it's plenty of plenty of uh, information, and to show you, this is an embryo vesicle days after uh, ovulation in the queen. Very small, 0.2 centimeter. Most of your vets will not do the brain diagnosis at this time because look at the of the embryos. You need a very good ultrasound machine and a very experienced ultrasonographist to perform this examination. But look, 13, 13 to 15 days after, the M 0.5 centimeter to seen and is close one centimeter in diameter, even easier to see. In queens, we can detect brain with ultrasounds earlier in bitches. So many vets will do the pregnancy diagnosis around three weeks after after, after mating. At two weeks, you just put the um, uh, oh the ultrasound probe on the belly of the animal. So you will be able to very quickly tell that, that if the queen is pregnant or not. Some interesting information that uh, breeders will like to hear. You don't need to clip the air of your cats to perform this ex examination. Uh, and uh, remember, I was doing lots of pregnancy diagnosis uh, with feline breeders. If I was clipping their hairs each time I was doing that, I will not be alive today, and I will not be able to tell you this. So we don't need to clip anything, and we can clearly visualize the embryos. 
and then we'll be able to see them growing. As you can see here, this is 38 days after the uh, beginning of pregnancy. We can see the head, we can see the heart, we can see the liver, we can see uh, the stomach, we can see the intestine. So there are plenty of uh, we can see, we can obtain uh, thanks to the follow up we will do with ultrasounds. We don't do uh, for the ultrasounds like in humans to detect abnormalities in veterinary medicine now. In the future, this is something that we will start to perform. But for the moment, uh, there, there is no additional value to perform this of test, and most of the veterinarians will not do it. Is ultrasound a very, very interesting tool? Because this is what you want to see. This is an embryo. You see it's round shaped. You can see the embryonic. Uh, the embryo just here uh, inside the embryonic vesicle, but if you look at here, there is inside the embryonic resorption, and this is something we will see in we will look for in cases of infertility to know that okay, is it a problem during mating or is fertilization okay? Uh, but there is something preventing the development of these embryos. We see this this resorption. Typically, the first thing we will look into is uh, feline leukemia because this is one of the most common uh, clinical expression of feline leukemia, and this is how feline leukemia might alter the fertility of some of the queens. And if the queen was checked before, we will be checked just to be sure that this is not related to feline leukemia, so we can rule out this possibility. But we need to see this embryonic resorption to guide us in the diagnosis approach. Remember before 35 days of pregnancy, we will not see any external sign of pregnancy arrest. So we need this clinical test to tell you uh, what's going on and to guide us in the next steps. X-rays can be performed, but X-rays are not generally what I would call a pregnancy diagnosis test. Uh, typically, they are done around 50, day, 50 days after the beginning of pregnancy. Because this is when the, the, the skeletons of the kittens will be mineralized, and this is when you will be able to see them, um, to, to, to see these skeletons under X-rays. Uh, it, really, it is usually interesting when you want to count the number of kittens in the litter, because this is a very, very interesting management, uh, very interesting data when it comes to managing parturition in the queens, because you need to know how many kittens have to be exposed. This is something also that us in veterinary medicine, we use a lot to check the position of the kittens uh, during whelping, because if we have a picture like this one that you can see here, this is a transversal presentation of a kitten. We see that, we know that there's no way the kitten will go through the pelvic canal. When we see that, this is a resist section. We will not try to use any medical treatment, because there is, it's pointless here. The only way to treat this is to go through a cyst section. So the slide. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this talk tonight. It was always, uh, as always, a pleasure to speak on female production. Thank you for staying up well uh, at night. I'm not sure if it's still um, on the western side of the country, but here it's close to 29. So uh, thank you. Now we'll have a five-minute uh, question um, session. So if you have any questions, please feel free, feel to use the chat, and I'll be more than happy to answer. Your question.